My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radical Radio, where we bring you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are facing many different struggles talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening is a crucial step in strengthening all of our efforts to change the world. On this week's show, I'll be speaking with Prescott Demas. Back in February, verdicts were delivered in two trials that painfully demonstrated the unhealed wounds and ongoing violence and oppression that lie beneath the mainstream rhetoric of reconciliation in Canada. For many observers, it was perhaps not a surprise when white farmer Gerald Stanley was acquitted on all charges after shooting Cree man Colton Bushy at point-blank range, nor when white man Raymond Cormier was acquitted in the death of Anishinaabe youth Tina Fontaine. As many pointed out at the time, this was not a sign that the settler state's legal system was broken, but rather that it was working exactly as it always had in terms of who it protects and who it makes vulnerable. At the same time, even if the outcomes were not a surprise, they were still profoundly upsetting, particularly for many people who themselves face racism and state violence on a daily basis. As well, the verdicts contributed to a rising tide of increasingly overt anti-Indigenous racism and reinforced all of the tired colonial narratives through which Indigenous people are portrayed as being somehow to blame for their own violent deaths. In communities across the country, Indigenous people and their allies responded to these verdicts in a range of ways. Much of this response involved all of those ordinary forms of taking care of each other that make community community, including through ceremony. Others were more public expressions of mourning, of solidarity with the families, and of a desire for justice, like a vigil or a rally. And in some places, the public side of the response took on a more enduring form. In Regina, they call it the Justice for Our Stolen Children camp. At the time that I interviewed Prescott Demas, a Dakota man originally from Chinupawakpa in Manitoba, the camp across from the provincial legislature of Saskatchewan had been going strong for 41 days and showed no signs of fading. The camp was originally proposed by Rochelle Dubois. Her 14-year-old son Haven Dubois died under suspicious circumstances in May 2015, and the family has been deeply unsatisfied with the official investigation and with its conclusion that his death was accidental. And indigenous activists and their allies in Regina happen to have plenty of experience with the camp as a form of political action after the four-month Colonialism No More camp outside of the Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada or INAC offices in the city in 2016, so it was easy to pull together what they needed for this new camp back at the end of February. Though the camp was initially inspired by the Stanley and Cormier verdicts, Prescott says that the issues raised by those cases are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the many forms of injustice that take such a heavy toll on young Indigenous lives. Some injustices that get treated as historical by mainstream commentators continue to have major downstream impacts today, and many others, the rhetoric of reconciliation notwithstanding, are no less urgently present than they have ever been. He says that any path to justice will require talking about residential schools, the 60s scoop, contemporary child welfare policies executed by organizations like Child and Family Services, or CFS, racial profiling by police and other ways in which Indigenous people are criminalized by the so-called justice system, the ongoing tragedy of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, all of the forms of oppressive regulation of Indigenous peoples by the Indian Act over the last 150 years, and of course the underlying issues of the theft of the land and Canada's refusal to honor the treaties. Prescott says, however, that the camp is not making any demands, and he does not feel that it is his place to try and change any other person's mind. He doesn't necessarily use these terms, but it sounds like the camp is more like an active witness, perhaps an accusation, and certainly an invitation. The invitation is to dialogue. Prescott is quite clear that, at least so far, governments in Canada have shown no real interest in reconciliation. Yet despite this, and despite the upsurge in overt racism in the wake of the verdicts, he does see hopeful signs among ordinary Canadians. So in large part, the camp is meant as an invitation to other residents of Regina to come, to spend time, and to talk. 
Prescott hopes that through this dialogue, more Canadians can be inspired to listen, to read, to learn, and to change their own minds away from, quote, this fairy tale version of how Canada came to be, end quote, that our governments and media teach us, and towards the kinds of understandings that will be necessary to make true progress towards justice. I spoke with Prescott about the impact of the Stanley and Cormier verdicts, about the larger issues of colonialism and racism in Canada, and about the Justice for Our Stolen Children camp. My name is Prescott Demas. I am from Tinupawakpa, Dakota Oyate, here at Turtle Island. This camp was originally set up after the Gerald Stanley verdict and the Raymond Cormier in Winnipeg. There was a camp that had set up in Winnipeg shortly after the verdicts, followed by a camp in Calgary, and it was suggested from someone here, Rochelle Dubois. Her son was found in a creek here 2015. He was 14. He was found face down in a creek. He was uh, young. He was healthy and he knew how to swim. He was in a foot and a half of water and the police ruled it accidental. And so she's been pushing it for an inquiry. She suggested the camp. And so a bunch of people jumped in to support. So hopefully everyone in this country has heard about the cases you mentioned. But just in case, give listeners a, a bit of a summary of them, maybe starting with the Stanley case. In 2016, a group of kids had gone on to the property of Gerald Stanley. He came out and, you know, I guess they tried to jump on a quad or however that unfolded. But he did come out with a gun and he ended up shooting Colton Bushy point blank. He was acquitted of second degree murder and acquitted for, well, nothing, even not even a manslaughter charge. Tina Fontaine was a young girl from Sagan First Nation in Manitoba. She had come into the city of Winnipeg. She had connected with her biological mom. She was raised by her great aunt, Thelma Fable. And when she came into the city, she was uh, like the two different cases because in her case, she was how she slipped through the cracks of CFS, Child and Family Services. She had been reported missing. The police had actually stopped her in a stolen vehicle and she was released because the cops did not get that red flag of a missing person. So with her case, it's about how she slipped through the cracks of the system. She was found wrapped in a duvet in the Red River in Winnipeg and Raymond Cormier. With that case, I can understand how lack of evidence led to his acquittal. But those are both two cases of Aboriginal justices that they just don't serve Aboriginal people. Tell me about the impact that the verdicts made. Immediately after the Stanley verdict, you had a lot of people who, you know, they stand up and they support this system. Some people have said the system is broken, but the system is not broken. It's a colonial system that was designed to protect colonial settler people against Aboriginal people. The effects that it has is it brings these people out of the woodwork. Now they're openly vocal about that racism. I mean, like in Saskatchewan, you had KKK groups that were up in Saskatchewan in the 1920s, a couple thousand members. When you talk about that system and how it works, you have that people that uphold that system. You know, these KKK groups, their ideology falls onto their kids and their kids' kids. So a good case to bring to mind is Helen Betty Osborne in the Paw Manitoba in like 1972. She was picked up in a vehicle by four youths and she was beaten, raped, stabbed well over 60 times with a screwdriver, thrown out of a vehicle, left to die in the ditch. She died. But for well over a decade, the whole community of the Paw Manitoba had known what these four kids do, even the chief of police. There was a movie, a book about it. It took 16 years before that whole thing came to trial. And of those four, only one was found guilty. But it's the people that uphold that system and their values, their views. They protected these four kids from murdering an Aboriginal girl. That life, that Aboriginal person, was not as important as protecting the four that had killed her. Obviously, white guys, white people, killing an Aboriginal person. It, 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 it is that effect that white people feel. With the Gerald Stanley trial and the whole thing, the way it played out, what I see in there is a lot of racism and all that discrimination. Those ideas, those views, they come to light and they're there. The effects of that to come out and to be able to shoot somebody and not be held accountable, that brings out those people who stand for the property over a person's life. With the Gerald Stanley verdict, you have people that are coming out and those attitudes are there. It's finely worded and carefully worded, you know, that stereotype of, Aboriginal people, 
you think Aboriginal people, you're thinking criminal, drunk, violent, all those things, they come into play even before you think of him as a person. Colton Bushy was 22 years old. He was a young kid. I was there at the trial. I listened to Gerald Stanley's testimony, and he says that as soon as they arrived on his property, he automatically thinks of this murder that happened nine kilometers down his road, but it happened 30 years ago. But that's to put that jury in that mind frame, that mindset, and yeah, all those things. When you go back and you talk about things like the residential school, you know, that stereotype that's been placed on us. Canada, with the residential schools, it was there to take the Indian out of the kid, right? And the residential schools just continued on to the 60s scoop, which continues today with the child and family services. The system, like the whole Indian Act, came into play with the residential schools. And, you know, the system, like we weren't allowed Canadian citizenship until 1960. And when the Indian Act was rewritten, it further entrenched this constitution to protect its citizens from us, you know, from us rise up to reclaim what was supposed to be promised to us through treaties. The residential school was created to take the Indian out of us. The 60s scoop stole our children. They were then handed off to be raised by white people in hopes that these kids would not come back to reclaim their treaty status. The CFS system works in the same way, except when that system was created, it was created behind a legal framework. CFS workers can come in and take our kids just, you know, with cops in tow. That whole system that the Indian Act created, it took our people and put them on reserves. It segregated us. It isolated us so that we could not connect with one another. We could not connect to stand up against our treatment. Even with the laws that the Indian Act had, that it prevented us from seeking legal representation to challenge the Indian Act or to try and get us out of the cycle that this whole system created and placed on us. Tell me more about the beginning of the Justice for Our Stolen Children camp. Like I said, it was suggested by Rochelle Dubois. I guess my experience from the other camp. Uh, And that's referring to the Colonialism No More camp, which was outside the Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada office in Regina for four months in 2016. A lot of people were familiar with setting up a camp and all those things. So when Rochelle had suggested it, all these people who were familiar with what to do, we had come out here and we just set up a camp right outside the legislative grounds. We set up camp at about 1030. We came in with a couple tents. We set up our tents. We had a fire pit for our sacred fire. We lit the fire. We knew that we had a teepee coming in. So we're digging out the hole for the teepee, like in the snow. The janitor had come out from the legislative building and he asked us what we were doing. He said that they sent them from inside. So I said, well, if they want to know what we're doing, I said, they can come out here because we have media coming here at 12 o'clock. And he went back inside and nobody's come out since. Nobody from the legislator have come out to actually talk to us or find out why we're here other than what the janitor told them. Also, on that day when media was there, Wascana Authority, which is... We're in the park, Wascana Authority, which is right across the street from the ledge, a large park here in Regina. They tell the public that they're working with us. And once the media leaves, they came and they hand us an eviction notice. We have to be off premises by five o'clock, but we've been there for 41 days so far and they haven't come back. But they will tell the public through media that we are there illegal and we do not have permits and all these things. I want to point out that out here, we are on Treaty 4 territory. And they do have land acknowledgements in a lot of these places here. The university, when they deliver a speech in Parliament here or even in City Hall, they all acknowledge that we are on Treaty 4 territory. So this camp is set up on Treaty 4 territory. And, you know, Wascana can come out and they can talk to us about our camping or us being there without permits, but they haven't yet. Originally, the colonialism no more camp that was on Albert, we... We're there to spread awareness. We were talking to people. We invited everyone in. A lot of people that supported that camp support this camp. And the premise is still the same. I've been there a majority of the time. I think I may have taken a couple nights off so far, but I'm there. I invite people to come in. I invite everybody in, anybody, you know, all walks of life coming in to talk to me. And I'm there to create a dialogue, to share my story with them, or I should say our story with them and to make them I guess, to understand the issues that we're talking about and how they affect us. My hope is not to change their mind. My hope is to get them to actually look into Canadian history and hopefully they can change their own minds, that they can see that 
you know, the treatment of my people through, you know, like Canada celebrates this 150 years, but to us, that's 150 years of oppression. Maybe they can understand that something has to change. And that change from this government has got to come from the people. So what does it take in practical terms to keep a camp like this going in March and April in Regina? We have a sacred fire going 24 hours a day. We get donations. We have people that bring in food, but it's the firewood through donations that have helped us to keep that sacred fire going. I think through our experience from the other camp, we understand what it takes to keep a camp going, to maintain it, and to make sure that we have that support from outside, just the people who are in the camp. What other groups in the community have been supporting the camp? Well, you have Colonialism No More, you have SCAR, Saskatchewan Coalition Against Racism, Voices for Justice and Police Accountability, you have SMAC, Students Mobilizing Against the Cuts. We have members from AIM, Saskatchewan. We also have support from QP Union, Unifor Union, RDLC, Regina District Labor Council. And then you have support from other people that are able to put the word out there. It's through their friends, through their networking, that they're able to you know, say, okay, look, the camp needs firewood or something. It increases that social media outreach through the people who support it. And that's a walks of life. Everybody. You mentioned earlier that the park authority, I think it was Wiscana authority, had said that they want you out of the park. Are you concerned that they might try to force you out, or do you think you're okay for the moment? Wascana authority, like I said, they came by on the first day and they handed us an eviction notice. We had the issue of being in the park and there's no washroom facilities there, but there is a park washroom that's just right across the field from us. And so what we were doing, we were getting people to call in to Wascana Authority to have them open our facility. And we had a lot of people that phoned in for us and they all got the same email. It talks about the permits and us being there without permits. So it essentially is saying that we're there illegal. The washing facility will not be open till May 1st. Those are the rules. We had a porta potty that was brought in and Wascana Authority made that company take it back. We had it for about six hours. But other than that, Wascana Authority have not come to us. I do know that Rochelle Dubois had communications with the chief of police out here, and she had told him that, you know, we're here, we're setting up a camp, and he had messaged back to her that he's okay with that and he can respect that. The issue of us standing here and saying that we're on Treaty 4 territory, you know, this is why we're here. We're talking about Indian issues, Aboriginal issues, and we're here, we're on Treaty 4 territory. It kind of crosses that fine line, that sensitive line with uh, Aboriginal issues. So for Wascana Authority to actually move in and take our camp out, it's going to be real bad public relations for them to do that. So we've been there already for 41 days. Nobody's come out to challenge or to try and kick us off. So however long this camp decides to be there, I'm fairly confident that there really won't be any strong opposition. How has the mainstream media coverage been so far? They have been around. A few people have come in to do interviews. You know, they give that story of why we're here and how long we've been here. And that's pretty much as far as it gets. We had a little event there on Saturday, Taco to Me About Justice, where had Indian tacos. We did have CTV there. But yeah, most of the exposure comes through social media. What kinds of conversations have you been having with members of the public that stop by the camp? Canada has done so well in hiding its history from its population. It's fed them all this fairy tale version of how Canada came to be. We had lots of people come through and a lot of people are surprised at some of the things that have happened to First Nations people throughout history. Those people that come through are open-minded. I've had a few people that actually have come through to argue that the system works, but it's not my place to change their mind. My hope is that they really read Canadian history and change their own mind. But we have all walks of life that come through, people from pretty much all these provinces. We've even had people from other countries. The Stanley case, the Cormier case, are both tips of the iceberg to the injustices that we're talking about. There's all these issues that help us to point that these two cases that, although they are in the spotlight, are only the tip of the iceberg. There's many, many more. These are the issues that we're talking about, these ones that affect us on a daily basis. 
I say to white people, to settler people, that to them, this is just a story in, a, say, a book and where they can turn the page and just continue on. But to us, this is embedded in our life. These are issues that we face on a day-to-day basis. And does the camp have a set of demands? No, we don't have demands. I mean, like, we're not terrorists. And that's one of those worded things that that say, okay, what are your demands? We're not terrorists. We have no demands. But like I said, nobody from parliament has come out to talk to us or to question why we're there. They are probably hoping that, I guess, through time that we're just going to get tired of sitting there. My whole thing about being there is to spread awareness to people. It's the people that I want to talk to. It's the people who can share my word and share it with their friends. And That's where my hope goes from there. So. What kinds of changes do you think need to happen to get, as the name of the camp says, justice for stolen Indigenous children? In Trudeau's election promise, he promised to completely implement the 94 calls to action of the TRC. Call number one is to monitor care. Sorry about the sound cutting out there. What Prescott was saying was that the very first call to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was that the number of Indigenous kids in care that is under the authority of supposed child welfare organizations be reduced. The statistics don't change from before Trudeau was elected up until today. Our kids are still being taken at an alarming rate. Saskatchewan and Manitoba have the highest rate of Aboriginal kids in care. Manitoba has well over 1,200 kids in care. And just a little under a thousand are Aboriginal. Saskatchewan, the percentages are 80%, maybe a little higher. Those stats have not changed over the years since Trudeau's coming into office. I know that these people can say that they're doing something to move on it or to change it or to try and do something, but you know, they should be talking to us Aboriginal people. They can create a committee to deal with the CFS system, but the CFS system is there to take apart our families. And, you know, we do not meet up to the high standards that society has. When you look back on the treatment of us, and we were forced to raise our kids in poor conditions, in poverty, and we've done a fine job doing that on our own. But the way the CFS looks at us, they can come in and any little small excuse, they can come in with the cops, they can take our kids, they make it so hard for us to get our kids back. We jump through hoops, we do everything, all the program that's asked for. I've had my kids taken, I've done everything, but they will not give our kids back until they are ready. But when you talk about that, you know, we have that ability, we have such a large family, our reserve systems, our community systems. When they come into the city, we have such a large family instead of taking our kids and handing them out to white families and you know these families are going to raise them in that christian environment they're not giving back their culture they're not giving back their traditions in fact they're making these kids i call them lost kids because they're lost they do not feel at home in a white family setting but to come back at home and to learn their traditions or their culture it gives back that sense of what they lost so you know return our kids find a way to keep them within our community and to keep that culture in them and to keep that traditions. There are people in our community who can do this, but requires, uh, it has to cut through that red tape of what Ottawa wants or how Ottawa thinks that we should be raising our kids. Let us decide, let us raise our own kids. We turn our kids back to our families. And as Pam Palmer said, you know, just stop stealing our children. So we've talked a bit about the CFS role in taking Indigenous children, but I guess the other side is the loss of Indigenous children and youth to violence, like with Colton Bushy, and how the criminal justice system is sometimes the source of that violence, or in other cases, as in Colton Bushy's case, allows and enables that violence. What changes need to happen to start addressing that? When I talk about our kids growing up in a white family setting and being lost, right? Once they hit that legal age of 18, they're kicked out. There's no follow-up care for these kids. If they do not know who their family was, they cannot come back to reconnect to get that help that they need. They're troubled kids. They're gobbled up by the system and they're spit out when they're 18. The effects that that has on them are to, you know, like what that street life is, that street culture, to get swallowed up into that. You graduate from that foster care system into the prison system. 
you know, and you have things like racial profiling from the police. So they graduate into the prison system and the prison systems themselves represent a large number of Aboriginal people. So it's just that continuation of that cycle to keep our people oppressed and to keep us in poverty and to give us that stereotype, to feed that stereotype that we're all criminals. All these issues, and we talk about the justice system, we talk about the child and family services. It comes down to the treaties. That's the way I look at it. This whole government has built this system. We're a commodity. Aboriginal people are a commodity to this government. By keeping us oppressed, keeping us in poverty, they can create their own departments to take care of us. This government, it feeds itself as us being its commodities. This system has to change. It does not work for us. It's going to take people to create that change. And when we talk about spreading that awareness, it's getting people to add to our voice. And it's going to take everybody. It's going to take our allies. Because so many times we've stood up, we've screamed, we've yelled, we've cried, we've protested at all these injustices that have happened to us. But we get quieted it down. They wait for us to slowly quiet down so that they don't have to deal with it. But when you have your own people, our settler people, standing up and screaming, okay, yes, join our chorus, join our yells. That volume of that voice gets louder and louder. Eventually, that government is going to have to listen to its people. And, you know, this government is so corporate that it's all about profits over people. And what would you say to listeners who want to act in support? In order to support, the first step is to become aware, to learn and to actually talk to us and to come and to understand us. Working on that solution, it takes people to come together. We all need to be on that same page if we want to create that change. That comes with understanding each other and to understanding just where our problems are. And hopefully with that, those collective minds, we can come up to an agreement together, not this imposed laws, rules, and regulations that the government throws on us. The government, like I said, they're not ready to reconcile. They have an agenda that is totally different. Capitalist system, you know, it doesn't work for us. You have been listening to my interview with Prescott Demas about the Justice for Our Stolen Children camp. To learn more about it, you can go to the Colonialism No More page on Facebook. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, or to suggest topics for future shows, go to talkingradical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. I'm your host, Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists, Gender and Sexuality, and Resisting the State, both from Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week.